BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You're listening to Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. This is a story of Owen, 27, living in London, happy in his job and his long-term relationship with his boyfriend Rich. That is, until his boss goes missing and Rich suggests an open relationship. You can expect it to be funny, heartbreaking and candid, and sometimes the language is strong. This abridgment for BBC Sounds is read by me, Paul Reid. By the time I spotted the pothole, it was too late to pull on the brakes. All I could do was shut my eyes and hope the impact wouldn't be too bad. I lay there for a few seconds, breathing through the pain and cursing myself for not paying attention to the road. I'd been craning my neck to read a street sign, trying to remember my way to the pub where I was meeting Rich and his friends. I heard the blast of a car horn and looked up, dazed, to see a man gesturing violently to my bike, which was blocking his way. Typical London, I thought. I propped the bike against the wall and pulled out my phone to call Rich. I felt guilty to be ringing with such a mood killer, especially since I had only recently resolved to make more of an effort when seeing Rich's friends. Rich and I had been together for nearly six years, and it had started to bother me that I wasn't closer to the other people in his life. I'm after coming off the bike, I told him when he answered. Oh shit, are you okay? he asked. I couldn't help feeling comforted by the concern in his voice. I'll come find you. I reached the corner of the road and spotted Rich walking my way. Just the sight of him was enough to make me relax. I lowered the front wheel on the ground and accepted his kiss. So, he said, checking his watch, there's a bike shop down the road we should see if it's still open. He picked up the bike, which looked a lot lighter in his hands. I mean, it's not like Dublin was perfect for cyclists, I said, as the bike shop came into view. But there it felt more like neglect than design, you know? Rich didn't answer. He was waving to the bike mechanic, who was wheeling in some models he had out on display. Rich put down the bike and turned to me. Do you mind dealing with this? I'm going to run back to the pub. Danny and Shanice are leaving early and I haven't seen them properly in ages. I was sure he'd seen his whole uni gang in the past month or so, but... I thought it'd be petty to say as much. Of course, I said instead. I'll be there in a few minutes. Rich gave me a peck on the cheek and jogged up the road in the direction of the pub. I squinted against the evening sun and watched him go. Another Londoner in a rush. I got to the pub about 20 minutes later. Rich and his group of friends, whom I privately named the Member Wens, due to their insatiable appetite for anecdotes from their uni days, were gathered around a table by the front window. They were sitting in a shaft of evening sunlight so strong that Kev and Olga were obliged to shield their eyes with one hand to look at Shanice and Danny. Andrew was at the head of the table. Despite Rich's suggestion that they'd be leaving early, Danny and Shanice seemed in no rush. Six, including you? Andrew asked Shanice. Including me. And did the rest of them know he was sleeping with five other women? Olga asked. Two of them were living together, Shanice said. So... Are you still seeing him? Rich asked. The table laughed while Shanice placed one hand on her chest and winced. Even if he hadn't lied, Shanice said, I have no intention of being in someone's harem. Well, polyamory is way more popular now, Andrew said. Not with me, Shanice said. It sounds like getting stuck in a house share for the rest of your life. Danny nodded, seemingly relaxed enough about her own lifelong house share. Well... I wouldn't mind living in a house like that, Andrew said, looking around the table with am I right fellas expression. Rich caught my eye and grinned, perceiving, I guessed, my internal eye roll. And on that enlightened note, Shanice said, we'd better be going. Sorry to miss you, Owen, Danny said, tapping me on the shoulder as she passed. Did you get your bike sorted? I opened my mouth to reply, but the pair were already waving goodbye to the rest of the group. In the brief pause that followed their exit, I noticed Kev giving Olga a swift kiss on the cheek as if to reassure her that he didn't have any other wives he'd neglected to mention. I looked back to Rich, hoping for another private smile, but he was staring off towards the bar. 
Andrew drained the last of his IPA and announced that he'd have to go. Rich said that he'd get one last drink to keep me company. I felt like I'd won a prize in a raffle. In return for seeing Rich's friends, I was being rewarded with a bonus mini-date. Just me and Rich. I'd have to be up early to open the cafe, but it would be worth it, I thought. He ruffled the hair on the back of my head as he returned to the table, and I smiled up at him. Were you here for Shanice's story? He asked as he sat down. I caught the ending, I said. Bit of a bombshell. I suppose if he had been honest, then maybe they'd all be happy with it. Somewhere at the back of my head, an alarm bell began to ring. Maybe, I said, although that's quite a big if. And, Rich said, his gaze drifting into the middle distance. I suppose that polyamory is one thing, but there are degrees as well. Degrees, I repeated. The alarm was growing louder. Is it something you've ever done? He asked. What? An open relationship. I laughed. <laughs> what do you think? I asked. Rich knew pretty much my entire romantic history, and given how brief it was, I felt it was obvious that I'd have mentioned something like an open relationship before. Is it something you'd be interested in? He asked. The alarm in my head stopped ringing, replaced by a deep, dark roar. I put down my glass and rested my hands on the table, attempting to tether myself to something solid and unbreakable. I've... Is it... Do you think it's something you'd be interested in? As soon as the words were out of my mouth, I realised they sounded more like an invitation than a question. Rich smiled. I might be interested, he said, his smile growing. Maybe it's something we could try, he said. For the second time that evening, I felt as if I'd been launched forward through space. I wondered if the landing would be as painful this time round. It was just after four, and the cafe was quiet enough for me to hide behind the coffee machine and message Jacks. Don't suppose you're free in a bit, I wrote. Could do with a chat. I heard a soft cough and looked up to see a bespeckled woman peering down at me. A cappuccino, extra hot, she said. And I found this on the way in. She handed me a card. I glanced at it while I tapped in her order. It was a gym pass, belonging to someone called James Howard. Thanks for that, I said, leaving it on the shelf under the till. It would be an hour before I could reasonably start to kick people out, so I decided to tackle a few of the grimy shelves under the counter. Rebecca, who owned the Quarter Turn Café, was due back from holiday that evening, and I was also hoping that busying myself would keep my mind off Rich's proposition. At half four, Hugo shuffled out from the back room we ambitiously referred to as the kitchen. Finished, he declared. Hugo had made a total of four toasties at lunchtime. Two had been ordered at the same time, which had made him fling a tea towel against the wall, raging at the cruelty of the world in which a man had to produce such vast quantities of food for a gluttonous and unfeeling populace. Just before five, I flipped the sign on the door to close and turned to Trevor, our oldest customer, who was asleep by the window. Will I put that in a takeaway cup for you, Trevor? I said, loud enough to wake him. Yes, please, Owen. What do you think your chances are tomorrow? He asked, and my heart sank. Trevor held an unshakable belief that I shared his passion for sport. He would often commiserate with me when my team lost, never giving me quite enough information to figure out who my team were. Oh, I wouldn't be massively optimistic, I ventured, adopting what I assumed was the pained expression of a long-suffering fan. Trevor nodded sagely and gathered up his things. Now that the cafe was empty, I was faced once again with the image of Rich grinning. I tried to put all my concentration into the cash-up. I heard a rap at the door and looked up to see Al standing there. He waved his keys and pointed to the lock in which I'd left my own set. While Rebecca was away, Uncle Al, who might or might not have been Rebecca's uncle, had been dropping in now and then to see that everything was in order. I opened the door and stood back as Al strolled past me. He paused in the middle of the room and nodded towards a lamp. Cobwebs, he said. Well spotted, I said, trying my best not to be intimidated by his inspection. Details, said Al. I returned to the counter and began counting out the notes from the cash drawer. 
The card machine had packed it in earlier in the week, so we were only accepting cash until Rebecca could order another. How's Billy doing? Al asked. I counted the fifty pence pieces into stacks of ten while contemplating my answer. Billy, a baby-faced twenty-one-year-old, had been working at the cafe for three months and still didn't know what a flat white was, much less how to make one. But Billy was very sweet and genuinely sorry when he made a mistake and, crucially, he was the cousin of Rebecca's and therefore, perhaps, a relation of Al's. Billy's doing well, I said. There was a fifty pence difference between the end of the day report and the actual takings, but I decided it would do. I took the money downstairs to the storage area, which was equipped with a desk, a safe and a subterranean staff toilet so grim that we almost never used it. I knelt to open the safe, then became aware of Al hovering behind me. All correct, he asked. A fifty pence over, I said. Details, in it. I'll check with Billy tomorrow. He may remember how it happened, I said. Billy had a better chance of reciting the Koran, but Al seemed satisfied. Then, just as I opened the door to the safe, he said, Take twenty for yourself, son. You had a long day. There was something different about him now. The boring uncle buttonholing someone at a wedding replaced by someone more watchful and vaguely menacing. I paused, then said, Ah, no, thanks, Al. I got a few quid and tips today, so I'm grand. You sure? he asked. This was definitely a test. Ah, yeah, I said. The last thing Rebecca needs on her first day back is a float she can't make head nor tail of. I was doing what I often did when I felt intimidated. Making my accent stronger, hiding behind the Irish lilt in the hope that my nation's reputation for being sound, likeable people would protect me. It must have worked because Al smiled. Fair enough, son. I yanked open the door and scampered off in the direction of the bus stop. I glanced over my shoulder as I went. Through the window, I could see Al standing with his hands flat against the doorframe, his head bowed. He sighed heavily, and I momentarily worried that he was about to come after me to complain about another cobweb he spotted. But then he strode back into the gloom of the empty cafe. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 2. Owen has gone to see his best friend and enthusiastic crafter, Jax. What kept you? Jax asked, leading me into the living room where I noticed the tapestry on one wall had grown since my last visit. I got cornered by Uncle Al, I said. Jax groaned sympathetically. I don't know why you don't get a better job, she said. You shouldn't have to put up with that interfering old geezer. This was easy for Jax to say, of course. She could walk into any interview and convince the employer at least to let her take a stab at the job. Besides, I liked the rhythm and the rituals of the quarter turn. The morning rush and the afternoon slump as regular as the tide. What are you working on? I asked Jax. Keen not to dwell on my career prospects. A christening present for Claudia's niece, Jack said, picking up a small embroidery hoop with the outline of the words badass stitched into the fabric. Claudia was Jack's flatmate. She'd moved in with her when our house share came to an end. Looking good, I said. I'm sure the baby will appreciate it when she's old enough to read. Where are you going this evening? It's someone's leaving drinks at the paper. To my knowledge, Jax had only done a handful of days at the paper since she was brought in for their quarterly fashion supplement. I couldn't imagine why she'd want to go to a leaving party. I thought it would be a good chance to mix, she added. Mix with who? Own, I only have an hour till I have to go. What's wrong with you? I took a breath and tried to find a way of putting it that didn't sound blunt and slightly absurd. There wasn't one. He wants an open relationship. Jax looked up. Rich wants an open relationship. Yeah. Right, she blinked, seeming genuinely confused. I didn't think he had it in him. What do you mean? I asked. Well, Rich seems quite careery, quite, um... Boring? Sorry. She put down the hoop. How are you feeling? she asked. 
I fiddled with the drawers of an upcycled apothecary cabinet while I tried to think of an answer, but found I couldn't. I feel like a bit of a failure, I said eventually. Jax was shaking her head, but I went on. Like, if I was enough, he wouldn't want my permission to go off with someone else. If your relationship was a failure, he'd have gone off with someone else already. I just don't want anyone touching my boyfriend. Jax nodded. He said it might be fun. I looked at Jax, expecting a snort of derision. When none was forthcoming, I repeated the word fun. Still nothing. It was as if he was suggesting that we go snorkeling or something. Fun. Well, said Jax, it could be. What part of my boyfriend going off and fucking a bunch of random strangers is fun, I asked, hearing my tone of voice change from heartbroken hero to stroppy teen. Has it occurred to you that an open relationship applies to both parties? It hadn't. Of course it has, I said. I'm just not interested in that. Anyway, last night, the longer we talked, the more it felt like an ultimatum. Did Rich say it was an ultimatum? No, I wanted Jax to stop being reasonable and join me in saying how simply awful this was. He didn't say it in so many words, I went on. But it was as good as him saying he isn't happy and wants something to change. But he didn't say that, Jax insisted, did he? I had a sudden urge to throw her badass embroidery project out the window, but instead I shook my head. Eventually she put down her work. Do you want some advice? she asked, or do you want to get anything else off your chest first? The question was a strangely calming one. I took a breath and let it out slowly. Advice, please, I said. Well, she said, the first thing you should do is consider yourself. Is it something you'd enjoy? Having the freedom to try things? I stared at her. It was like she was suggesting that being shoved out of an aeroplane would give me the freedom to fly. I mean, she continued, you've only ever been with Rich. That's not true, I reminded her. There was a few guys back in Dublin. Fine, she said, waving her arms as if to dispel the ghosts of the men I'd kissed clubbing all those years ago. But Rich has been your one big life-defining relationship and maybe before you turn 30 and move in together, she held up a hand to stop me from interrupting, maybe it's worth trying something new. You could have a three-month review or something. See how you both feel at the end of it. I'm a bit peckish, she said, getting up. Do you want some toast? I felt that the life advice was concluded for the day. Who did you say is leaving the office? I asked as Jax took out the bread knife. Michelle, said Jax. Good for Michelle, I said. Shaking things up. And do you know anyone else going to Michelle's drinks? I asked as Jax rooted about in the fridge. Or is it just going to be the pair of you? Well, if you must know, she said with a bubble of joy in her throat. I may be hoping to run into someone else. I've been sharing a lift with this guy at the paper. Has he told you his name? His name's Aaron, but I found that out by other means. Have you spoken? We have not. It sounds like love, I said. I'd better leave it to get ready. The only thing left on my shelf of the fridge was a hardened block of cheddar, so dinner was a cheese sandwich eaten alone in the front room. The house was still though I could hear the tinny noise of music playing from a laptop in someone's room. I decided to message Rich. Good luck with the interview, I wrote. Rich was on the lookout for a deputy principal job. He had grown frustrated with the small private school where he taught. He replied a few minutes later with a photo showing his fresh haircut. It looked good. Thanks, he wrote. We'll let you know how it goes. Kiss. This was such a normal exchange of messages that I considered simply ignoring yesterday evening's suggestion until it went away. No, I had to follow Jack's advice and grab the bull by the horns. But for now, I avoided taking any such action by going into Rich's Instagram and then his Facebook page, looking for evidence that he had been getting itchy feet over the past few months. I didn't know what I was looking for, maybe a shot of him salivating as he stared at another man. But the search proved unfruitful. Most of the photos were group shots of the member wins. Eventually I went to my own profile and started retreating back through the years, 
comparing recent photos of the two of us with those taken in the past, searching Rich's face for signs of discontent or fading happiness, it occurred to me that I was now the age Rich was when we met. I messaged Rich again. How about I come round tomorrow, can make you dinner and we can chat, kiss. Sure, he replied. I'll leave a key out. Kiss, kiss, kiss. I thought Rebecca was due back this morning, said Billy. His face was flushed and he had rolled up his sleeves of his thick jumper so high that they were almost wedged into his armpits. So did I, I said, and glanced at the door, willing Rebecca to run in and explain that she'd overslept after a late flight. Why don't you take off the jumper, Billy? You look a bit warm. That'd be great, he said, although I'm not wearing a t-shirt underneath. Do you think that would be a problem? One of the customers, who had been staring at the clock, sighed and made a great show of looking at his watch. Over at one of the tables, a woman was waving at us, clearly wondering when she would be served. She had, I noticed, stacked the plates and cups of the last customer to one side. Her companion was sweeping crumbs into his hand. All of a sudden, the music we were playing seemed terribly loud. I stepped out from behind the counter, much to the dismay of the waiting customers. Jesus, I said, blinking up at the wide, firmly planted man I had run into. Sorry. That's okay, said the man, looking at me with the wary expression I instantly recognised. Jim Pass, I said. Sorry? You left her... I picked myself up and jogged back behind the counter to grab the card. His fade was fresher in the photo, but it was definitely him. James. Yes? You left this, I said, and passed him the card. Someone handed it in. I waited for a moment for a thank you, but he was staring at the card as if I'd passed him a tablet of hieroglyphics. So I returned to the coffee machine and the never-ending row of tickets. Billy was taking someone's order, so I was flying solo again. I flicked on the grinder and looked back at the queue. The guy with the gym pass, James, was still there. He was about my height, but his bulk obscured my view of the other customers. I was wondering, he said, if you're hiring. I wish, I said, but you'll probably need to drop in another time with the CV. Any time in particular? <sighs> Any time that isn't rush hour, I said. James's eyes widened, but then he nodded. Sure, he said. I'll call back when you're calmer. I scoffed and turned away from him, nodding along to the music in an effort to show just how calm I could be. Here, he said. He leaned across the counter and left the glass next to a stray porter filter. You look like you need it. I could hear banging coming from somewhere, then Hugo's bell started ringing. Yes, Hugo, I said, stepping back into the kitchen. That's Billy, he said. He's locked in the toilet. What? The lock's broken. Don't use it. I kept telling myself to bring it up, but it was Rich, after showering and eating as we were cleaning up, who said, So, did you think any more about what I asked the other evening? I took a deep breath. Yes. And? I'm open to the idea. A smile flickered across his face. It sounds like there's a but coming, he said. Well, there is. I think we should trial it for a fixed amount of time. The smile returned, wider now. What? I asked. <laughs> you sound like you're in a boardroom planning some kind of PR strategy. He looked happy, and I could tell how much he'd been hoping it would go this way. I briefly considered putting up more of a fight, but it was too late for that. Or so it felt. I think we should talk about it again after a while and see if it's making us happy. Sure. Well, how long is a while? Three months, I said, trying to sound firm but reasonable. Fine. He opened his mouth to say something else, then closed it again. What? Just wondering if I should get my diary or whether we can book a meeting room closer to the time. You should do stand-up. You really should. He came close and hugged me. I closed my eyes and wished I could keep him like that, wrapped in my arms. I think this would be really good for us. Rich whispered in my ear. I felt his arms tighten around me and I knew he was waiting for me to agree. Me too, I mumbled. BB.
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 3. The open relationship with Rich is on, and Owen has surprised himself and ended up in bed with a man in eyeliner who he flirted with on the tube. I woke up with a gasp. I glanced to my right, confirming that I hadn't imagined bringing home a stranger and staying up until 3am. I decided to go in search of coffee, thankful that I wasn't due in the cafe until the afternoon. I had finally given myself a morning off, suggesting to Uncle Al that he could always call in and see if Billy and Hugo needed a hand. On the floor by the front door was a postcard, with a selection of pictures from the Isle of Man on one side. I flipped over the card and saw that the signature at the bottom was Rebecca's. Hey man, said Eyeliner, who had materialised from nowhere. Shit. Sorry I scared you. No, no, you... Uh, I waved the postcard. Jesus, I thought. I must really be hung over. I was struggling to form sentences. Do you want a coffee? No, I'm, I'm going to meet a friend. Water or anything? I really wanted to get rid of this guy before my housemates woke up, so why was I trying to bribe him into staying with the selection of hot and cold beverages? I should go, he said firmly. Sure, sure, I said. Uh, thanks for, um, thank you for letting me stay. I smiled and gave him a little bow as I opened the door, like the hotel concierge seen off a high-profile guest. Rebecca's postcard wasn't the chatty missive I had been expecting. We'll be abroad for longer than expected. Do not let Al close the cafe. Pay yourself from the till and keep records. We'll sort pay slips on return. How bizarre. I went to refill my glass of water, wondering what could have happened to her and why she thought Al would shut down the cafe. At least it wasn't my problem that morning. As I was making my way upstairs, I heard my phone ringing. When I checked... I saw I had seven missed calls from Billy. Owen? I could hear the desperation in his voice when I rang him back, but I refused to be moved to sympathy just yet. Billy, what's up? I couldn't get into the safe. I, I couldn't see where the keypad is. There's no keypad, I said, avoiding the temptation to tell him we'd gone over all this five times since his cash-up mistake the previous week. It's opened by a key which is in its own security box behind Rebecca's computer. You should have a text with the code to that on your phone. Listen, Owen, it's super busy. It would be great if you could come. Where's Al? Don't know. Billy, how are you taking payments if you don't have any change? Contactless. What do you mean, contactless? The card machine's broken. Oh, yeah. I glanced at the postcard. Rebecca had a lot to answer for. My hair was still wet as I set off for the quarter turn. The blast of hot water in the shower made my skin tight and dry, and yet I couldn't stop grinning. The further I got from the awkward goodbye, the giddier I felt at the thought that I'd actually picked up a gorgeous man on public transport at that. And from what I could remember, it had been a lot of fun. By the time the quarter turn came into view, my walk had become a strut, then, when I saw that today's milk delivery was still sitting on the doorstep, it turned into a run. It was about as disastrous a scene as I had anticipated. There were no pastries on display and no music to cover the sound of the highly irate queue. The cafe's three two-seater tables and its large central dining table were totally covered with dirty plates, teapots and takeaway cups. There was a smashed milk jug in the middle of the room. A pigeon flew in through the open door behind me and a woman screamed. Right, I said, walking behind the counter. We need a reset. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, but we're going to have to close for half an hour. There were groans and sighs, as if the assembled crowd had been dying to sit in a filthy cafe while a pigeon sipped milk from a puddle on the floor. Leaning against the counter was the guy with the gym pass. Rush hour, he asked. Not quite, I said, but unfortunately we're closed for the next half hour. So, no chance of an interview. I brought a CV. He seemed highly amused by the situation. A sarcastic cheer came from outside. Billy had successfully got rid of the pigeon. I'm sorry, um, um, James. 
I actually wanted to ask you if you needed a hand right now. Billy slipped in the puddle of milk. The crowd outside gave another cheer. Look, I said to James, we're not taking on any staff at the moment. James glanced over his shoulder to where Billy sat, rubbing his wrist. He turned back to me. Can I say it looks like you should? The honour is actually away, I began. What's going on? said Al, barrelling through the front door. Why are all these people queuing outside? Why aren't we open? On second thoughts, I said to James, help me clear a few tables. We can do a proper interview this afternoon. Not a great day for you boys, said Trevor as I served him his cappuccino. We had managed to reopen and get through lunchtime. James had stacked plates and wiped down surfaces in silence, the look of mild amusement never leaving his face. Not our finest hour, I said to Trevor, but we got it under control. Under control? Ha! <laughs> I don't call losing 5-0 under control. I decided he was talking about either a high-scoring football match or a low-scoring rugby game. Sometimes you're just beaten, I said. I glanced at my phone. Rich had messaged to say that he'd be back this evening if I wanted to hang out. I put it away without replying. I'm going to take a break, I said, and went outside, where James was sitting with an oat flat white. So, I said, as I sat down pretending I had conducted many such interviews, tell me a bit about the last place you worked. Well, I'm an actor, and have you worked in a cafe before? He tilted his head from side to side like this was a philosophical conundrum. I worked my auntie's cafe when I was younger. I nodded, my heart sinking. And do you have any acting work coming up? Nope. I was a bit spoiled in my first few years out of drama school and then... Anyway, yes, I'm very available. Glancing inside, I spotted Billy in screensaver mode, staring into the middle distance. Well, how about three shifts a week to start? Sounds fine. I paused and decided to be honest. I should mention that we're not quite sure when the owner is getting back from holiday. I'm sort of filling in as manager. Right. So I'm afraid it'll be cash in hand. Is that legal? he asked. Well, I'm not a lawyer, I said, but I reckon we'll get away with it for a week. Sure, he said, and raised an eyebrow. I mean, if you're the public face of a sinister gang, they've chosen well. He took a sip of his flat white. You look pretty innocent to me. I couldn't tell if this was a dig or not. Right, I said, choosing not to dwell on it. Well, see you on Monday at nine? Cool, he said, and finished the last of his coffee. After he left, I closed my eyes for a minute, the late night and the frantic start of the day finally catching up with me. I remembered that I still had to reply to Rich's message. I wasn't sure what to say or whether it would be strange to see him mere hours after saying goodbye to my first new bedfellow in years. I heard Al's snuffling and opened my eyes as he sat down. He threw two bags of pound coins onto the table between us. Everything under control now, he asked. Uh, yeah, just about. Doesn't look great, things getting out of hand like that. I tried not to let the annoyance show on my face. I should have been at home all morning, maybe even lying in a park. Well, I said, we got it sorted. Seems to me, Al said, leaning in close, that we should think about shutting up shop for a few days. Till Rebecca gets back. Rebecca's postcard flashed through my mind. How had she known? Isn't she due back any day? I asked. Al shrugged. And anyway, I continued, your man is coming in for a few shifts this week. He gave me a quizzical look. My man? James, I said, the, the guy who was helping out. Al glanced over his shoulder, perhaps expecting James to be lingering there waiting for his approval. Who gave you permission to be hiring and firing? He asked. Well, Rebecca actually arranged for him to come in, I said. And I postponed it because she wasn't back yet, but I can't keep asking him to wait, can I? I knew that this patchy web of lies could be torn apart by a single message from Al to Rebecca, but the tone of that morning's postcard suggested the two weren't in contact right now. If Rebecca was telling me to pay myself in the till, I reasoned she obviously trusted me enough to keep things rolling until she got back. Besides, Rebecca deserved my loyalty. She could be a demanding boss, but she never blamed me when I made mistakes. 
and on more than one occasion she had given me an advance of my wages. If she and Al were in some sort of battle of wills, I knew whose side I was on. So, I continued, we'll stay open, see how this guy gets on. To my relief, Al just sniffed. I took this as silent acquiescence and went back inside. My phone buzzed in my pocket. It was Rich again, saying he could meet me at the cafe when I was done. I replied saying I'd absolutely love that. Whatever awkwardness I might feel seeing him so soon after sex with a stranger, I just have to live through. I sat at the dining table that dominated the cafe floor and looked back towards the counter while I waited for Rich. Shutting down hadn't taken long and I'd been able to send Billy home about twenty minutes after we turned the sign to closed. I rarely sat down in the quarter turn and it was odd seeing the place from a customer's perspective. I looked around and amused myself with an old project of mine, trying to think if there was any way I could convince Rebecca to add a bookshelf without disrupting the style of the place. I had raised the idea before. Rebecca said she'd consider it, but she never mentioned it again. As I mulled this over, my eyes came to rest in the tip jar by the coffee machine, which, in the name of minimalism, Rebecca refused to label as such, and as a consequence often ended up being used by customers as a bin for tea bags and sugar packets. It was empty. I wouldn't have expected many tips from this morning's chaos, but I thought we'd have been left an odd bit of change in the past few days, particularly since the card machine was kaput and everyone was paying in cash. I heard a knock behind me and turned to see Rich waving through the glass door. Rather than the awkwardness I had anticipated, I felt a rush of excitement and practically ran to let him in. Rich starred my store, I said as I pulled the door open and held out my arms. I knew the Gaelic eye's name and the over-the-top endearment would be lost on him, but trusted that he'd pick up on the spirit of it. All right, my Irish man, he said, stepping into my arms. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 4. After a lovely night with Rich, Owen is feeling more positive and his friend Jax has encouraged him to get on Grinder. At first glance, the grid of faces, torsos and Himalayan sunsets was pretty underwhelming. I thought about what to use for my own profile picture, eventually taking a half-face selfie which I felt would lend some measure of mystery without having to resort to an unflattering body shot. But once I got my first bit of attention and a profile named Looking Around asked me for full body pictures, I found that I wasn't above unhooking my own mirror from the wall and trying to find an angle that made some of my curves look like definition. Now it was nearly midnight and I had to be up early to open the cafe. I looked at the copy of Mrs. Dalloway which sat on my bedside table, silently scolding me for wasting my time sending pictures of myself to any stranger who gave me attention, then getting frustrated when the chat petered out. I checked Grinder a final time. I had one new message from a profile with no picture. Hi, the message said. Hey, I replied, and then because I had learned that you saved time by doing so straight away, I sent a few of the pictures I'd taken in the past couple of hours. Lol, whoever it was, wrote. And then I got a selfie of James, looking at the camera with an expression somewhere between smug and unimpressed. I squirmed, put my phone down and went to brush my teeth as if doing so would scrub away the embarrassment. It didn't, so I went and picked up my phone. James had messaged again. Didn't even realise you were gay, he wrote. Well, surprise, I replied, trying to act as if I was used to this kind of thing. Well, I might block you, just so it doesn't get too awkward. Good idea, I wrote. I thought about adding no dick pics, but decided against it, thinking it would be a bit much with someone I hardly knew. Don't need my boss's dick pics taking up space on my phone, James wrote, clearly less concerned. She's a cross, said my sister Kira. A labradoodle, squealed the lady who had stopped to ask if she could say hello to Kira's puppy. What's her name? asked the woman. Slancha, said Kira. That's Irish for cheers, added Kira's husband Mark. I gave Rich's hand a squeeze. 
As usual, Rich was acting as a man-sized stress ball for me as I endured my brother-in-law. Oh, I know, said the woman. I'm half Irish myself. Ah, you've got the old coupla fuckle so, said Mark, clearly proud of his easy charm and linguistic skills. We were walking around Clapham Common, and Slauncha was having a perfect Sunday morning, yelping at bigger dogs and sniffing dandelions. Would you lads think of getting a dog yourselves? asked Mark. I love dogs, said Rich. I have one at my mum's house in Kent. He's an old boy, but I don't think I could get another while he's still around. You feel like you were doing the dirty on a dog? Yeah, something like that. Well, it's a great rehearsal for us, said Mark, getting used to having a helpless little thing pissing on the carpet. I glanced sharply at Kira. You're not... No, no, she said. Not yet, anyway. That's the other thing about London, said Mark. You just don't want family here, do you? The air pollution and all the crime, it's just crazy. And Dublin's expensive, but prices in London are just ridiculous. You really are turning 30, I said to Kira. Puppies and babies and property. Don't start, she said. You're making me feel old. You should have a think about it yourself, mate, Mark said to me. Like, do you want to grow old in London? I don't know, I said. I wanted to shut this down while I still could and looked to Rich, hoping he'd steer the conversation onto easier terrain. But either he was as stumped as I was, we'd already asked Mark about work, Leinster and Ireland's respective rugby squads, or he was happy to hear me answer questions about my long-term future. Gotta start planning these things, Mark continued. Like, the two of you would want to think about getting a deposit together on a house, wouldn't you? There's all this shite about people not being able to buy a house because of avocados, but the truth is... You can buy a house and eat avocados, as long as you plan. And so long as you work for a multinational, I said. So long as you work with your other half, said Mark, showing the faintest sign of annoyance. You have a few quid put aside, don't you, Rich? I do, said Rich, and took a sip of his takeaway tea. I hated him a little for not saying anything else, leaving me stranded as the only idiot with a zero-hours contract and a room in a grotty house share, surrounded by three bona fide adults with dogs and savings. See, if you lads put your money together, you'd find it's not actually that hard. Like, even renting together is cheaper, and then you can start saving. Rich finally intervened and asked Kira if Slauncha was playing fetch yet. I still felt abandoned. My only true ally was Slauncha who at least didn't look as if she had much in the way of savings. Rich reached for my hand, but I stepped away from him and crouched down to rub my new friend's belly. On the tube, an hour later, Rich turned to me, blinking in faint surprise. Are you getting off here? he asked. Yeah, we said we'd say it's yours tonight, didn't we? OK. The doors opened and we walked through the platform exit and over to the escalator. I don't have to come, I said. Up to you. We were silent until the top of the escalator. Well, I said as we approached the gates, should I tap out or not? Rich turned. Owen, it's 3pm and I'm honestly wondering how much more of my Sunday I want to spend with you. He was speaking very quietly which made him sound all the angrier. I've spent the day listening to you say how much you were dreading brunch with your sister and brother-in-law then having brunch with your sister and brother-in-law, then listening to you bitch about your sister and brother-in-law, and then listening to you have a go at me when I finally have the temerity to voice an opinion. I should probably have just conceded all this, but I hated being given out to, so instead I reverted to my earlier outrage. Your opinion, I hissed, was that I should listen to Mark and basically get my shit together. Passers-by were turning their heads. Fine, I went on. Mark's great. I'm a fuck-up. Happy? That's... Rich just shook his head and went through the turnstile. I hesitated, then slammed my car down on the reader and followed him out. Rich jabbed the button at the traffic lights. Rich, I began, but didn't get any further. When have I ever implied you were a fuck-up? He asked. I didn't reply. When have I ever complained about you having less money? He paused, waiting for an answer. You haven't, I said truthfully, and I'm sorry, I can save more if you want, if you want to save it for a trip or whatever, or a... I took a deep breath, a mortgage. 
if we wanted to buy somewhere, eventually. And then he gave that faint, sharp exhalation through his nose, a laugh that's not really a laugh, but the performance of a laugh, a kind of aerated eye roll. He laughed, if you could call it that, and I walked away. I flopped down on my bed and checked my phone. Kira had messaged to say how much she and Mark appreciated brunch. There was nothing from Rich. I was relieved that there were no messages from the cafe where I had left Billy and James to fend for themselves. And then I went on Grinder, which I had been avoiding for the most part since my embarrassing encounter with James. What had seemed baffling the other night now looked exciting. The perfect way to forget about mortgages and my stupid argument with my stupid boyfriend. A message arrived. Afternoon, sir. I looked at the messenger's profile picture. He had a Freddie Mercury-style moustache and an exaggerated pout. Hi, I replied. How are you this Sunday? Horny, I wrote. You? Sorry, he said. He let go of me and hung his head, admitting defeat. He looked a lot less like Freddie Mercury in the flesh. That's okay, I said lightly. No offence. You're a really good-looking guy. There were no pictures on the whitewashed walls of his room, just the odd pockmark where a wad of blue tack had taken a chunk of paint away with it. Look, do you want to just, he shrugged, you know, lie down together for a few minutes? No, I thought, that's a terrible idea. That sounds awful. Sure, I said. It felt like the quickest, least confrontational way out of there. We lay down. I stared at the ceiling and the bare bulb that hung from it. Can I ask you something? He said after a few minutes. Sure. Are you from London? I mean originally. No, I said. Me neither. Liverpool, I guessed. He laughed gently and said, <laughs> Close enough. How about you? Dublin. Why do you ask? Well, I was wondering, right? How do you make friends? I beg your pardon? In London, when you're not from here, how do you meet people? There was a faint smell of damp in the room. I had been looking for a vengeful shag to get over my anger with Rich, but this wasn't what I had in mind. Well, I said, I guess you meet... flatmates? He laid his head on my chest with a sigh. I tried not to flinch. The gestures seemed far more intimate than anything we'd done so far. I don't know anyone in this building, he said. How about work, I asked. It's all a bit cliquey in the office, and you're kind of left on your own a lot of the time. Maybe, I said, trying my best not to sound like a grandmother, maybe you could join a sports club. He looked up at me hopefully. Are you in any clubs? No, no I'm not. What did I do? I asked myself. He raised his head off my chest and I took the opportunity to wriggle away from him. Do you have friends? he asked. Of course I do, I said, feeling defensive. So how did you meet them? I've been in London for years now. You just get to know people, I guess. Well, you might do, I thought. For all the people I'd met through work, I didn't really have much of a social circle to show for it. I'd found that once our shift was over, colleagues I'd spent the past eight hours laughing and gossiping with became strangers, dashing off to their real lives while I went to meet Rich and his friends, who remained just that, his friends. How many other rooms like this were there in London, with bare bulbs and skirting boards coated in a layer of sticky dust, where single people lay on battered divan beds, swiping and messaging until it was time to sleep? Bit lonely said the not-quite-Liverpudlian. This was not the way to recover a lost erection, and I wondered if his heart was really in it. Mine certainly wasn't. Sorry, he said again. No worries. I might have to go soon, though. Gotta get back to the sports club. There was an edge of bitterness to the question. Yeah, I said, and swung my legs off the bed. Outside, I pulled out my phone. I'm so sorry, Rich, I wrote. I'm a complete idiot. Let me know if you're around to talk later. 
He still hadn't replied by the time I got home. Maybe he'd had better luck than me. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty, episode 5. A few days since their big row and Owen's apologetic texts, there's still no word from Rich. And at work, James has seemed a lot less combative. Flirty, even. James answered just as I was beginning to despair. I could hear a lot of noise in the background. I'm sorry to call on a Friday night, I said. I took a deep breath, not totally ready to admit why I was calling. I'm trapped, I said. Trapped? Where? In the cafe. In the downstairs toilet. I wondered how much I could explain over the phone. Rebecca's email had clearly been sent in a rush. In it, she explained that there weren't enough funds in the cafe's account to pay some of our suppliers, and now they were threatening not to deliver. She needed me to lodge some money in a nearby bank, And Owen, she wrote, it's V important you do this discreetly. I won't bore you with details, but there's a lot of family stuff going on. So I need Al not to know. I had decided that it made sense to count the money when the cafe was closed and there was less chance of being intercepted by Al. And when I let myself in, pulling down the shutter and locking the door behind me, it made sense to leave the lights off. And when I heard the rattle of the shutter being lifted, it made sense in the moment to slam the door to the safe shut and run for the nearest hiding place, the staff toilet. The lock is banjaxed, I said to James, hoping that a full explanation could wait. I was wondering if you could help me? Um, Could you ask Uncle Al? He might be free. Actually, Uncle Al is upstairs. Right. I could picture his furrowed brow. He doesn't know I'm here, and also, I said, accepting that I just have to trust him, I have a bag of money in here with me. There was a pause. I worried that I'd lost the signal. That's a sticky one, he said at last, in an admirably mild tone. I'll come. He hung up. I hadn't asked him how long it would take him to get here. I just hoped that Al would finish up whatever he was doing before then. There were two other men with him, and whatever they had been talking about for the past 45 minutes was certainly prompting a lot of laughter. Sitting in a cold, subterranean toilet with a bag of money that didn't belong to me on my lap, hoping that no one would open the door, I did wonder if my life choices had been good ones. When James finally let me out, it was nearly 10.30, so rather than going back into town, he agreed to let me buy him a drink in the pub around the corner from the quarter turn. James placed his phone face down on the table. I had explained my plan and my subsequent panic on our way to the pub. Mate, if you'd just left the lights on. If I'd left the light on, if I'd called out and said hello, all of these things were better options than trapping myself in a toilet. I can see that now. This is looking very suspicious. What? Me? No, the whole thing. This Rebecca woman, who's technically my employer, even though we haven't met. And just generally. I mean, why would Al be meeting people in a cafe after hours? It's all looking pretty shady. What do you think I should do? He shrugged. I noticed he was wearing a nice, bright T-shirt under his jacket and I felt a pang of guilt for dragging him away from his night. Actually, never mind, I said. Do you want to get back to your friends? It's not all that late. Nah, he said. I'm not sure I could be bothered. There was a lot of talk about going to G.A.Y. I haven't been there in years, I said. Lucky you. Speaking of which, he said as he leaned back in his chair. How's your man? Who? For reasons I couldn't put my finger on, I didn't want this conversation. Who? he echoed. The other half of your open relationship. I shrank a little into my chair. What does he do? He's a teacher. Very nice. James looked at me a while longer, then burst out laughing. What? Nothing. 
You just seem to be in agony talking about your boyfriend. No, I'm not. I dropped my gaze to the sticky rings of beer on the table. No more questions, James said. Interrogation over. Are you seeing anyone? I asked. No, well, I'm seeing plenty, just not dating. How long have you been single? I expected him to tell me to mind my own business, given that I had effectively said the same to him. Instead, he started counting on his fingers. Eleven months, he said, since my heart was broken. Heartbroken? He took another sip of his drink. Yeah, he said. When I fall, I tend to fall hard. Right. How did it end? He was fucking around, he said, looking me directly in the eye. Oh, so you weren't in an open relationship? Nah, nah, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I felt a bit giddy from the novelty of talking to James outside work, hearing him open up about himself as if we were actual friends. It was only as I was ordering the next round that I became aware of the silly smile on my face. When I came back from the bar, James's phone buzzed. The friends he'd left were asking him to come back. Sorry, I said, I, I shouldn't have got you that second drink. This I can finish whenever, he said, rattling the ice cubes in his glass. Do you want to come? I have work in the morning. You never worked hungover. I have, I said. Well then. Then, as if remembering something important, he put his drink down, leaned forward and asked, What do you want to do, Owen? What, what, in life? Yeah, where do you want to be? I don't really do five-year plans. Neither do I. But I know where I want to be. Where? On the stage, darling, he said, sweeping one hand through the air. Ah, yes. So, what do you want to do? I stared into my drink while I considered my answer. I'd like to run a cafe, I said. Not a cafe like the quarter turn. You mean not a front for Uncle Owl's criminal gang? I mean not just a cafe. I'd like it to be a bookshop with a cafe in it. A community hub, I guess. I stopped, thinking how ludicrous this must sound to James. But James just sat there, nodding, seeming to accept the fantastical idea that I could start a business. Well, you're doing a great job at the moment, he said. I'm sure you could run your own place. Cheers. I mean it. Right, he drained his glass. Coming. He winked, and I noticed he had a small scar just beneath his left eye. I wanted to know how he got it. I winked back and down the rest of my pint. We emerged on Tottenham Court Road an hour later and split the last of the vodka and coke we'd mixed on the tube. I saw that I had a message from Rich, who was breaking his five-day radio silence to ask how my evening was. He didn't even reference the lack of contact. I looked at my previous grovelling message and remembered how much I would have given for him to reply then, rather than just over an hour ago, when James and I had been starting our second drink. In my reply, I said that I'd been working late, and I had gone for a drink afterwards. I didn't mention that I was now queuing outside a club. Well... If you want me to meet you, I'm free, he wrote. Thanks, but I have work in the morning. Should probably go home soon. Sure thing. Speak tomorrow. Kiss. I looked up. We were at the front of the queue, and for a moment I wondered if I should go home, or for that matter to Rich's house. Wasn't now the time to make up properly. Come on, said James, and a thought skipped out of my mind. I was in the toilets, leaning against the wall and concentrating hard on not missing their urinal. The smell of stale piss and cleaning products had been the bouquet of my evening, I thought. I was watching James, from a distance, dancing with someone I didn't recognise. I was back in the smoking area, taking a breather. A breather from what? I couldn't remember. A guy who'd asked me to buy him a drink was pointing at me and giggling with a friend. James was kissing the man he'd been dancing with. Where had I left my jacket? It was around 4am when I got home. 
I was due in the cafe in three hours. I sat on the couch in the living room staring into space for a while. Then I took out my phone. I had several messages from James. The last read, Guessing you left. Get home safe. Kiss. I closed my eyes and let the wave of shame wash over me. When it receded, I wrote back. Classic Irish goodbye. Sorry. Thanks for inviting me along. See you tomorrow. Kiss. I decided I could almost trust myself not to throw up if I lay down in bed. But, I thought, why not have a look at Grinder first? Half an hour later, I was standing in the shower getting ready to go out again. I'd be knackered in the morning anyway, so what was the difference between an hour's sleep and no sleep at all? I stepped out and started toweling off. I copied the postcode of the guy I'd been chatting to into City Mapper. I closed the front door behind me, turned to where my bike should have been, and realised that it was still outside the cafe, where I had left it when James and I went to the pub. I checked my phone. My hookup was requesting more pictures. On my way, I wrote. You said that before, he replied. Sorry, I'll be there in ten. I put the phone away and broke into a jog, which I kept up until the map showed my blue dot almost next to my destination. I opened Griner to ask the guy for his house number. There was no sign of our conversation. He had blocked me. I slumped against the wall and let myself slowly sag to the ground. Somewhere at the back of my brain a headache was being born. I wish James was there. He'd find it hilarious, I thought, and that would make the whole thing worth it. I picked myself up and plodded back to the quarter turn. My bike was still locked outside, my helmet hanging from the handlebars. It all felt a bit surreal, going through my usual motions when I hadn't been to bed. I flicked on the coffee machine and stumped downstairs to get the float out of the safe. I turned on the light and knew, before I even took in the room, that someone had been there. I saw papers strewn across the floor. I was suddenly afraid. I unlocked the safe, almost certain that it would be empty. But inside, there was the float, in its bag, along with the takings from the previous month. I breathed a sigh of relief before I realised what was missing. The bag of cash Rebecca had asked me to lodge. I hadn't put it back in there. The moments after my escape rushed through my head. I had been so relieved that I had practically leapt on James when he opened the door and so afraid of being caught that I dragged him up the stairs as fast as possible. I fumbled about in the room in desperation, turning over stacks of papers in search of what I knew I wouldn't find. My mouth started to flood with saliva. I ran to the toilet, pulled open the door and retched. The door swung shut behind me. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 6. With a night of no sleep and a bag of money missing from the cafe, Owen has had an awful day when Rich comes to meet him from work. So, said Rich as we approach Wood Green, I have good news and bad news. My stomach twisted into a knot. Oh yeah, I said. The good news is that I got the job. That's amazing, Rich, I said, and turned to hug him. Yeah, he said, as we separated. I'm pretty happy. Then he frowned a little. Are you crying? Sorry, I said, blinking away the tears. I just know how hard you worked and... Owen, he said, laughing a little. Are you okay? I'm sorry, I said again. I've just missed you this week. I've hated fighting. Rich looked confused. What do you mean? he asked. Just after last Sunday I messaged to say how I was sorry for acting like a dick and when I didn't hear back from you I assumed that you were still mad. I was a bit angry, said Rich, but I knew you were sorry. Don't worry about it. It was my turn to be confused. How long had we been reconciled? How hadn't I known about it? I've spent all week thinking you were still furious with me, I said. Oh, said Rich. 
Sorry, I was just preoccupied with the interview and all that, so... Never mind, I said. Tell me about the interview. We were nearly at Alexandra Palace Station when I remembered. Hang on, I said, as Rich explained the timeline for changing school. What was the bad news? I noticed that he looked bashful. The bad news is that I had crabs, he said. Oh, feck. Sorry. I felt as if I'd been awake for a week. I suppose I'd better stay at mine tonight, I said. Yeah. That's a shame, I said. I quite like a night with you. Me too. He rummaged in his pocket. I brought you something. It was a tube of insecticide cream. On my bus back, Jack's messaged. You up to much? Incredibly hungover, I wrote. Equal parts exhaustion and guilt. Same. Want to pop over for tea? I stuck a pizza into the oven and made tea. What's up? I said. Aaron and I basically snogged and I feel like complete dirt and I don't think I should leave this house ever again. Am I a bad person? Jax asked. Definitely not, I said. You had a drunken kiss. You shouldn't beat yourself up about it. Yeah, she stared mournfully at the TV. Where were you last night anyway? I wondered how much detail I wanted to go into about my evening with James. Not too much, I decided. I've got a mystery for you, I said instead. Jack's mood picked up as I laid out my misadventure with the toilet door and the subsequent disappearance of the cash. Right, she said, tying back her hair as I arrived with the pizza. Suspects. Motivation. Opportunity. Who has the key for the cafe? Everyone except Billy, I said. So that's you, Uncle Al, Hugo, and James, I added. Am I a suspect? Not really, no, but including you makes it more fun. We spent another half an hour debating motives. On balance, Al seemed the most likely suspect. He had practically unlimited opportunity, and while his motivation wasn't immediately apparent, there was plenty to hint at dodgy dealings. What should I do about it? Owen. Don't you think you should go to the police? But how dodgy is the whole thing? I'm paying everyone under the table for one. I've hired someone without a shred of paperwork and ended up alone with him after hours with a bag of money that's now gone missing. As I spoke, the scale of my misdeeds came crashing down on me. Look, for now forget about lodging the money, said Jax. Plead ignorance if Rebecca realises it's missing. You won't be lying. You have nothing to do with the money being taken. But I won't be telling her the full truth. Do you think Rebecca's telling you the truth? I had no idea. When I saw her email, my inbuilt deference had kicked in, so I simply did what she asked. Now all I wanted was to go to bed. I should head, I said. Thanks for the tea. No worries. Thanks for the pizza. And for the distraction. I honestly forgot for an hour that I'm an other woman. Just let me know next time you're feeling blue. I'll get myself embroiled in some other criminal activity. By the way, Jack said as she led me to the door, I'm covering a launch for work on Tuesday and I've got a couple of spare passes if you and Rich want to come. I'll ask him, I said. Sleep well. We had just flipped the sign to closed. There's a cafe in Crouch End looking for a manager, James said, and it sounds like they have that community hub vibe you were after. Oh, right, I said, returning to the cash-up. I don't know if I'm qualified for that. Yes, you are, James replied. And you'd learn stuff for when you have your own place. I was surprised that James even remembered me talking about running a cafe. I'll think about it, I said. There, he said, as my phone buzzed. I've sent you the link for the job post. He stretched, and I kept my eyes on his face, determined not to look at the gap where his shirt lifted above his waistline. Listen, I said, my friend Jax has invited me to this fashion event tomorrow. I don't know much about it, but she told me there'd be free cocktails if you want to come. I tried to keep my tone casual. Cool, James said after a moment. Sure. He turned and I followed him, once again forcing myself to keep my eyes up. 
I think it's about a 10 minute walk past the building site. Jack said it would be signposted once we get in the general vicinity. I spotted a warehouse lit up in green and blue and led the way over to it. At the entrance, a woman wearing a brown waistcoat and some brass goggles strode towards us. Good evening, sirs. Welcome to the homecoming celebrations, she said with a booming voice that instantly marked her out as an actor. Have you journeyed far? I looked to James. I assumed he'd be more used to engaging in this kind of rapport. Oh, yes, he said. Our travels have been wearying, but we're excited to be here. Wonderful, said the woman. I believe Mr Fogg is due to land within the hour. Can I see your tickets? I spotted Jax just inside the entrance. Next to her was Aaron. Why on earth would she ask him? Sir? Yes, I said, and found the invitation that Jax had forwarded to me. The hostess produced a phone of her own, branded with the silhouette of Queen Victoria, and scanned the QR code. Owen, Jax called. You found it. She was wearing a purple velvety dress. You remember Aaron, don't you? James and Aaron were introduced, Jax and I going out of our way to make sure everyone knew that our respective dates were our friends and nothing more. I'm too scared to go any further than this, Jax admitted. I'm afraid of getting stuck in a conversation with an actor playing a chimney sweep. After a while, it became apparent that beyond the general steampunk theme, there was some kind of story that we were meant to be following as we walked around the warehouse in search of a drink. Every now and then someone would grab me and whisper something about a hidden crossbow or a scrambled compass, but I was always concentrating too hard and nodding politely to take in anything they were saying. So are we here to assassinate Phileas Fogg? Jax asked, as we avoided making eye contact with the stilt walker. No, said James. We suspect that Phileas Fogg is going to assassinate the Queen. An urchin tugged at his sleeve. Half an hour later, I was dragging James by the hand as we sprinted after the assassin. I was feeling the sugar rush from all the sweet cocktails. The hooded assassin ducked behind a curtain and a large bouncer blocked our way. We stepped into a gin palace, which looked like a fairground hall of mirrors. Distorted, gloopy versions of ourselves looked back at us through dusty glass. I hadn't seen Jack since she disappeared with Aaron and the urchin. Over the speakers a voice said, Ladies and gentlemen, please gather for the arrival of the eminent Mr Phileas Fogg. It seems like it's all kicking off out there, I said to James. Do you want to go have a look? No, I said, not particularly. Me neither, he said. There comes a point when it's inevitable that you're going to kiss someone. I realised that here, in the pretend gin palace with the smudged mirrors and cracked surfaces, I was going to kiss James. My chest tightened. How's your cocktail? I asked. Fine, he said, and put it down on the table beside him. His mouth was sweet and soft. I trailed one hand across his shoulders and pulled him closer to me with the other, while the sound of recorded propellers swelled and the audience began to cheer. James and I had been told the gin palace was closing, and we had split up to find a bar that was still serving when I spotted Jax leaning against a pillar not far from the exit. How have you been getting on? I asked her. Nightmare, she said slowly and took a slug from a bottle of water. Where did the urchin take you and Aaron? She took us. Jack shook her head and I could see that the gin and champagne had caught up with her. We went into this room where someone told our fortune. That sounds intense, I said. What did the fortune teller say? Oh, and she thought we were a couple. At least I think she did because she basically told me how happy I'd be with the man in my life. How my search was over. And what did she tell Aaron? I asked as I steadied her. Pretty much the same thing that his love line was unbroken. But then he made a joke about how his girlfriend wasn't there and her face just dropped, and it got so embarrassing. Where's he gone? He said he needed to dash for a train. He left about ten minutes ago, or maybe longer. I've been here for a while. I hated seeing her sad, but I couldn't help saying it. What the hell did you ask him for? Jax blinked at me in surprise and stepped away from the pillar that had been supporting her. I'm sorry. Look, we all make mistakes. The two of you had a drunken kiss on a tube platform, but, like, why did you ask him? It's like you wanted it to happen again. It's stupid. Don't you judge me, Owen. Don't you dare. 
We're not all getting chased around a warehouse by a man who's clearly besotted with you, all while you mooch about pretending to be this poor abandoned boy when Rich is clearly just... She broke off and shook her head. Clearly just what? I asked, but Jax looked at her phone. My Uber's nearly here, she said. What? Rich is clearly just sick of me. She turned away from me, staring at the road. I didn't know what else to say. I checked my phone. One message from Rich. Hope you had a good night. Kiss. And one from James. Good of you to see Jack's home. Just as well. Or I might have asked you to cycle over to my place. Jax's car pulled up and she stepped into it without looking back. As it drove off, I replied to James. Well, she just got into a cab, so you can ask me now. And sure enough, in that case, want to come over to my place? I looked back in the direction of the industrial estate and pictured James walking my way. The very idea made me grin. Yes, please, I wrote. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 7. Last night, James and Owen kissed and had a charge fumble on the sofa. Tonight, Owen and Rich are on a date. Rich wrapped his knuckles on the table between us and said, I've been thinking. You have? I asked perhaps inspired by the more suspenseful moments of the espionage thriller that we had just watched, he took a long, slow sip of his drink before going on. I'm not sure about this whole open relationship thing, he said eventually. What had brought about this change of heart? And why would he mention it now rather than on Saturday, when he was passing me the delousing ointment? What's changed? I asked him. Rather than answering straight away, Rich reached over to a nearby table for a beer mat and, in that sleek, ordered way of his, lifted my glass and slid the cardboard circle beneath it. You tell me, he said as he replaced my glass. In the moments of panic that followed, I was somehow convinced that Rich not only knew that I had gone home with James the previous night, but was privy to feelings I hadn't even processed yet. Don't you feel a bit... distant? he asked. How do you mean? I mean, I don't know if you look forward much to see me at the moment, or if you're that bothered when you don't. There was a time when you'd have been reaching out more. This was probably true. Well, I'm sorry, but I'm probably not besotted with you the way I was when I moved here. That came out harsher than I'd meant it to, and Rich's face fell. Instinctively, I leaned across the table and took his hand. I love you, I said, but I don't love you the way a 22-year-old would. He nodded slowly. I don't want to lose you, he said. That's not the same as wanting to be with me, I wanted to say. My hand was still resting on his, and I gave it a squeeze. I'd like to be exclusive again, Rich said. Would that be okay with you? I kept my eyes on her hands and I thought about what this meant. Stability, commitment, a return to normality, everything I wanted. The thought of James crossed my mind, but I blinked hard, determined not to let it linger. Of course that's okay, I said, looking up and giving Rich a small smile. Waking up beside Rich that morning, I had resolved to tell James as soon as possible that I was in an exclusive relationship again. Maybe if I brought it up casually, he would respond in kind. Yes, I had thought of my way to work. It would be fine. I just needed to get it out of the way. And yet the moment to break the news just hadn't come. I got to the cafe a bit before my shift was due to start in the hope that I could mention it then, but the queue was almost out the door and the dishwasher was misbehaving. And on it went until it was mid-afternoon and James was asking me if he could leave a little early. I was down in the storeroom at the time, searching for takeaway cups in the funeral pyre of boxes. Go for it, I said feeling relieved that I'd have to wait until tomorrow to tell him. I turned back to the boxes, but then he was beside me, turning my face to his, kissing me gently. Sorry, he said. Been thinking of doing that all day. 
No problem, I muttered, feeling my face grow warm. I didn't want to admit I'd been thinking the same thing, which might have been another reason I hadn't brought up the situation with Rich. James winked and clattered back up the stairs. Mark was working late, so Kira and I walked towards the common with only Slancha for company as the darkness crept in. When did you decide Mark was the one? I asked, surprising myself as well as Kira, who gave a short whoop of laughter. Kira and Mark had been together since they were both doing the leave insert, and in my mind they had been like a rock formation ever since, solid and eternal. This was probably what made me so harsh in my attitude to Mark. I knew I was stuck with him. But surely Kira and Mark had changed since they were 18, and if they hadn't, didn't they want to? When had they decided they weren't going to evolve out of each other? Honestly, I don't know, Kira said, though, <laughs> she laughed again, softer this time. At the end of first year in college, I was completely stressed out about exams, and Mark was already finished, and one evening, he was meant to be going on a night out, and I called him in a bit of a state, and he just came to the library and sat next to me instead. Kira came to a stop. I know he can be a bit of a dose when he wants to be, but he's forever doing that sort of thing for me. He drops what he's doing and comes, even if it's just so he can be there. After a second, she started walking again. What about you? When did you know Rich was the one? I didn't have an answer. I used to, I thought. You're right, I said instead. It's hard to put a date on it, isn't it? In the weak light of the morning, I could make out a large figure leaning against the front door of the quarter turn. The man lifted himself up from his slouch as I approached. Morning, I called, attempting casual cheerfulness. We don't open for another half an hour. Don't care, he said. I came to collect some money. He towered over me. He had the flattened nose of a boxer, paired with the cauliflower ears of a rugby player who thought scrum caps were for fairies. This situation was definitely above my pay grade. Mate, open the door. Listen, I began, but then oddly I found I was lying on my back and my nose was throbbing as though it had just been punched. In fact, hey, I heard someone calling from down the road. What the fuck are you doing? He had punched me in the nose. I opened my eyes to see Hugo launching himself at the giant, hurling what I assumed was abuse at him in Polish as he did so. A car slowed and honked. The heavy obviously decided it wasn't worth hanging around any longer and strode off. I looked at my reflection in the stainless steel surface of the coffee machine. The skin around my eye had darkened and my nose was an angry red. I gave it a careful prod. Jesus Christ! I glanced up to see James standing at the counter. You should see the other guy, I said with a smile. I've been waiting all morning, maybe all my life to say that. What the fuck happened? I explained my early morning altercation. Why are you even working? he asked. I didn't want to leave Billy in the lurch. Billy, who had been eavesdropping, said, Thanks, Owen. As Billy grabbed the tray, James said, Can I speak to you downstairs? We went to the office. What's up? I asked. James took a deep breath. I got a job. I blinked, confused. Job? A play. It's small, but it's paid and pretty good. Amazing, I didn't even know you auditioned for a play. Yeah, he said. I don't really mention auditions unless I have to. Anyway, I hope it doesn't mess you about too much. Here, I mean. I finally caught up with him. He was leaving. Oh, I said. Of course. No, no, it'll be fine. I mean, how long will we be open anyway? Well, not being funny, but if you're getting attacked, it might be time to move on. And listen, I'll see you anyway. I mean, I'd like to see you. He smiled. Now was the time, I realised. I wondered if he was looking particularly attractive because he was happy about the acting job, or whether it was just in my head. I'd like to see you too, I said. I badly wanted to grab him, kiss him, even though it would probably result in a fresh nosebleed. But, I continued, Rich and I have decided to be exclusive again. James flinched, looking away from me. Timing's good then, he said. Might have been awkward. 
As if to prove this was true, an agonising silence fell on us. I'd still like to see you, I said. You know, as friends. I had an amazing time the other evening. So did I, he said. But it's probably better we don't. He started climbing the stairs. James, wait, I said, following him. Sorry, Owen. He turned on a step and looked back down at me. I told you, when I fall, I fall hard, and I don't need to fall for you. And then he was gone. I sat at the bottom step and closed my eyes, focusing on the steady beat of pain in my nose until it blocked out everything else. I was restocking the milk fridge when I heard a loud banging on the door. I poked my head above the counter, fully expecting the giant to be back for more. I was barely any happier to see that it was Uncle Al. I was surprised it had taken him this long to get wind of the morning's incident. I better let him in, Billy said. I sighed, gave the fridge a quick wipe and stood. Al marched up to the counter and silently scrutinised me for a moment. He seemed unsurprised by my appearance. What did he look like? he asked. He was... Big, I told him. Yeah, Al said. I know the guy. He looked tired, and I found myself wondering just how old he was. After a moment, he slapped his hand on the counter. Right, he said. Time to close. We were just finishing, I said. Nah, I've had enough of this shit. Bill, pull down the shutter. You, he said, pointing a thick finger at me. Get the money out of the safe. When I came back upstairs with the contents of the safe in a bag, Al was laying out the day's takings across the counter. Billy stood beside him. Al, I said, I was actually just about to do the cash-up. He ignored this and said, What's your rent? My rent in my house? Al nodded, and when I told him he grabbed the bag off me and counted out the figure in twenty-pound notes. Month's rent gives you plenty of time to find a new place to work. Can't say any fairer than that. Was I being fired for getting punched? I'd been planning on leaving, but not like this. Al, I said, feeling thoroughly fed up, I don't want to find another job. And anyway, isn't it up to Rebecca? Rebecca's a junkie, said Al, his voice breaking. Rebecca has a problem. I looked at Billy, not quite believing that I was seeking clarity from him. Billy nodded. She does, he said. I looked at the stack of notes in my hand and wondered what I'd been missing. Every now and then Rebecca would refer to wild times she had in the past, but it had never crossed my mind that she might have struggled with addiction, or be struggling with it still. Al was chewing his top lip, his face contorted in what looked like a mixture of anger and sorrow. So where has she been? I asked, but the answer came to me immediately. The missing money. Jax and I hadn't thought to put Rebecca on the list of suspects. Had we learned nothing from Jessica Fletcher? I pictured her creeping down the stairs that night I was out with James, searching for the key or maybe something to sell, and instead coming across the bag of cash, just sitting there in the desk like a miracle, left for her by the useful idiot she'd put in charge. I felt, not for the first time that day, stupid and found out and cheated all at once. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty. Episode 8. With the quarter turn closing down, Owen has been offered the cafe manager job that James encouraged him to apply for. This would be a great winter, I told myself as I wheeled around the corner of my road. As manager, I'd be in charge of rotas, and once I was settled into it, I could make sure I had time off to spend with Rich, do the things he wanted, see his friends more often, and be on time when I did. With the salary, I could actually plan holidays and even think about savings, or a house. Well, maybe a house was a stretch, but at least we could talk about the idea without making Rich laugh. I'd only just closed the front door behind me when Rich knocked. I was waving from down the road, he said, as I opened it. But you were in a world of your own. I have good news, I said, almost knocking him off his feet as I pulled him inside and closed the door. Oh yeah? Basically, the trial shift went well and I've been offered the job. 
With a flourish, I produced a bottle from my bag, holding it up as a kind of proof. Oh, Rich said as he turned to shut the door behind him. Is this another cafe? Yeah, I said. I told you about it during the week. It's the management position. Rich frowned and shook his head slightly. Hadn't I told him? Sorry, I said. I didn't even say hello just now. I was pretty excited. I felt ashamed of my exuberance now and I became self-conscious, standing there with the bottle. I put it down on the couch and wiped the condensation off my hand. That's cool, Rich said, dropping his bag and sitting down. It's just... It sounded like you might be looking to do something a bit more ambitious, now that you're clear of the other place. This is ambitious, I said. I've never managed anywhere before. Yeah, sure, he said, and picked up the bottle of sparkling wine, worrying the edge of the label with his thumbnail. He gave me a sympathetic but piercing look I imagined he usually reserved for misbehaving students. Is this what you moved to London for? I took a step back. I felt as if someone had shoved me hard in the chest, knocking the air out of my lungs. The room felt tipped off balance. I moved to London for you, I whispered. The sheer confusion that spread across his face was frightening. I knew I had concealed the fact when we were first seeing each other, worried that it would scare him off. But hadn't he realised in the years since? Why else would I be here, I asked. Rich gave a nervous laugh. <laughs> You were moving here anyway, he said. I wasn't even in London when you came over. He held eye contact with me as he spoke. Either he was committing to a bold-faced lie, or he really believed what he was saying. I turned and walked away as Rich stood up from the couch. I could feel that my breath was shallow. I circled the room, gripped by the terrifying thought that, for six years now, I've been making every choice in my life based on one person, who didn't even realise what I was doing. I'd left the friends I had in Dublin, and once I was here I'd stepped away from almost every offer of friendship and community because I wanted to leave what time I had outside work for rich. And why? Clearly, other men were attracted to me, and one was maybe more than just attracted. So why had I changed my life for this one? Rich was beside me now, rubbing my back. What's the matter, Owen? I waited until I was breathing more steadily before I answered. I met someone, I said at last. Rich dropped his hand and leaned against the wall beside me. Was it someone you met while we were open? Rich asked. Yeah, I said. Then deciding I'd had enough of half-truths, I added, It was James, the guy who was working in the cafe. Rich shut his eyes tight and groaned in frustration. Do you want to be with him instead? He asked after a moment. I was tempted to say that I didn't, or that it was over now anyway, but I stopped myself. I don't know, I said, but I feel different. What do you mean? I feel like he saw me in a different way, or maybe... When I was with him, I saw myself in a different way. I didn't feel like I was in the wrong job or not sorted enough. I didn't feel odd or quiet. I just felt like me. I felt more like me with him than I do with you. This, I realised, was an awful thing to say, but as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I felt far calmer. I took a deep breath, stood up straight and lifted my T-shirt to wipe my eyes. But as I watched him search for the words, I realised that it was over. I was breaking up with Rich. I had the strange sensation of floating on the ceiling and looking down at us both. The way survivors of near-death experiences describe watching doctors trying to resuscitate them when their heart has stopped. And, much like in a near-death experience, I felt somewhat serene as I looked down. It's not your fault, I said. I just think I gave up a bit of me by being with you. And I sort of want it back. I had asked Jax if she was free to come to James's play, but she had a date organised, her third in as many weeks. 
She was no longer paying attention to Aaron, who was apparently still smiling at her whenever he got the chance. I hadn't been sure if Billy would be interested in attending a fringe play about the brothers Grimm, but when I got in touch he was delighted at the prospect of seeing James perform. The theatre was tiny, with two rows of chairs running the whole way around the stage. It smelt of warmed up dust and herbal cigarettes. James was sitting in the middle of the stage, smoking and scribbling on a yellowed piece of paper. Seeing him, I felt a gentle jolt of adrenaline and prayed that he wouldn't look up and see me before I'd had time to compose myself. When I booked the tickets for the show, I had imagined watching him from a safe distance, but I realised as I looked around that there would be nowhere to hide. At the curtain call, Billy gave an appreciative whoop that drew James's attention. He briefly squinted and smiled in our direction as he bowed. That was amazing, said Billy as we filed out of the theatre. James is such a good actor. Do you think we'd be able to see him if we hang around? I'd imagine so, I said. It doesn't look like the kind of place with a separate exit for actors. We lingered near the bar until James emerged from the theatre, smiling modestly at the huddle of people who surrounded him. You were great, said Billy. I can't believe all the voices you can do. Yeah, it really is the funny voice show, said James, and turned to me. Thank God I didn't do an Irish one. I wouldn't be able to look you in the eye, Owen. I've heard your Irish accent, I said. It really wasn't that bad. We chatted for another minute about the show and then Billy gave James an update on the cafe, which was now be converted into a CBD retailer. Hugo's going to run it, he said. James laughed loudly, the sound of which I realised I'd missed more than anything. And how are you doing, Owen? He asked, throwing a quick glance over his shoulder. Sorry, he added. That's my agent. She brought a casting director tonight, so I have to go and do some of the boring chat in a minute. How are you, though? Grand, I said, then figured I might as well be brazen. I was only saying to Billy, it's all change. I have a new job, newly single, everything's, yeah, different. I watched James' face as he nodded, trying to guess what he was thinking. What's the job? he asked after a moment. I got that manager job in the cafe in Crouch End, I said. The one you suggested I applied for. I knew you would, James said. Considering you ran the quarter turn pretty much single-handedly, managing must be easy for you. Billy laughed. Single-handedly, he repeated, amused by the absurdity of the idea. Ah, yeah, I said. It's not so bad. And I've started this arrangement with the bookshop down the road. We're going to host book clubs for them. Stock local interest titles, that sort of thing. I shook my head and looked at the floor, conscious of how small that sounded given that i just watched James on stage doing the one thing he most wanted to do. But James shook my shoulder and said, That's amazing. Sounds like you're making your mark. Ah, yeah, I muttered, struggling to find anything else to say. Sure, listen. James held my gaze for another moment before saying, I better head back to these guys, but thanks again for coming. It was over. I had spent most of the past week deciding whether or not to come and then, once I had booked, wondering how it would be to see James again. And now it was barely an event. It was just a series of polite exchanges. See you guys soon, James said. He gave my shoulder a squeeze. Keep in touch. He strode back to his agent and we made for the exit. I heard his laughter drifting across the pub. Outside I said goodbye to Billy, who was taking the tube, and crossed to the bike rack opposite the pub. I wrapped up for the cycle home, thinking about James's parting words. Keep in touch. That was the sound of being fobbed off. I thought going to his show would be a chance to reconnect, maybe to start again. And he had just volleyed the ball back into my court. Fuck it, I said out loud and pushed off. Breaking up at Rich had tipped my universe off balance. Most mornings I woke up to find myself confronted by a wasted half decade of my life and at night I would imagine the comforting shape of him next to me as I fell asleep. But more and more often, when I walked Slancha with Keir or sat making plans for the cafe, I felt as if the world was finding a new axis. 
and I got a sense of what my life could be like with no one but myself to blame or thank for what it was. But still, at the traffic lights at Highbury and Islington, I pulled out my phone to check. And still, when I saw that James had sent me a message, my heart leaped. See you soon, X. The light turned green and I started pedalling again. I passed into Highbury Fields and dropped the gear as I climbed the gentle slope. At the top of the hill I paused, one foot on the ground, watching my breath dissolve in the air. I stayed there for a few minutes, calculating how long it would take to get home and how long it would take to get back to the pub. I considered how it might feel to arrive and find that James was gone. Disappointing, I reckoned, but nothing I couldn't handle. Then I thought of how James's face might look as he turned to see me. The way he tilt his head to one side, ready to hear what I had to say. I thought of how much I wanted to ask him, how much I wanted to tell. Then I turned around and started cycling back down the hill. Sounds Like Fun by Brian Moriarty was read by me, Paul Reed. It was abridged by Rowan Routh and produced by Allegra McElroy. It's a BBC Books production for BBC Sounds. <laughs>